Hello, my name is Joshua Gilliland. I'm a California attorney and blogger for Bowtie Law and the Legal Geeks. Thank you for joining me for my 2012 Case Law Year in Review. 2012 has been an incredible year for e-discovery cases. Let's begin with some of the top ones that we can learn lessons from. First, for some social media cases. This was a big year for me because I was actually cited in one court opinion. The case was in Santa Clara County, and it involved a restraining order in service of process. The judge actually stated in his court order, this court has obtained some useful points and authorities from Bowtie Law's blog of June 25th, 2012. Great little quote, and I appreciate Judge Manukian for the shout out. I'm very excited because Judge Manukian will be the discovery judge here in Santa Clara County for the 2013 term, and he really knows e-discovery. I am very optimistic. We're going to have some great cases before the judge that you will be able to weigh in on, on e-discovery here in Silicon Valley. Twitter made a lot of news this year with the case involving an Occupy Wall Street protester in New York. In the case that took place, Judge Matthew Scanaro stated, if you post a tweet, just like if you scream it out the window, there's no reasonable expectation of privacy. This case was huge and there's an appeal going on and you know the, the defendant ended up uh, pleading guilty. So a lot's happened in it. But this case resulted in Twitter changing its terms of service policy because Twitter doesn't want to be out there litigating whether or not uh, tweets can be private or public. So it's shifted the issue to the users on what they tweet if they're going to try to protect something under the Stored Communication Act. But, you know, there's this very growing, you know, reality that if you put something out there publicly that you do not have a reasonable expectation of something that's been put out in public. So discovery. We've had some big e-discovery cases this year. And one of my favorite ones has this amazing quote by Magistrate Judge Mark Fall. In it, the judge stated, this case should be about the merits, not some esoteric electronic discovery issue. I cannot stress enough that that quote really needs to belong on t-shirts with all the great e-discovery companies out there making software that, that finds things. Now, what exactly happened in this case? Well, it was on one level a rush to the courthouse with the plaintiff in, in trying to bring a motion, trying to compel a forensic search of the defendant's system. And in it, the defendants did admit that they used the wrong search terms and that they searched things that were not the right areas to search. And they went out of their way to correct their mistakes. However, there were some big issues with this because this was not at the beginning of the case, but the case had been around for a while. And in it, the judge stated, it appears that the defendants failed to meet their federal rule of civil procedure 26F ESI obligations at the outset of the case. The briefing discloses that defendants counsel was not aware of the structure of the defendants computer systems until recently. And it is inappropriate for the defendants to only now, three years after the case was filed and after discovery has closed, to investigate their electronic systems. All not good things. And so in this, the court stated, it was unclear whether the burden and expense of conducting the electronic discovery outweighed the benefit of doing so. As such, the court could not discern from the papers whether a deep forensic search was justified. So it brings us to a couple big lessons learned. Attorneys need to argue ESI is not reasonably accessible because of undue burden or cost under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure Rule 26B2B or that the expense and burden of conducting the electronic discovery outweighs the benefits of doing so under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure uh, Rule 26B2CIII. So what's this mean? You have to prove, you have to demonstrate, you're going to have to use an expert and have affidavits filed explaining what the discovery is, how much it's going to cost to, to restore it, or you know, whatever the situation is, so the court can look at this and go like, you're right, that will be unduly burdensome because it's going to be super expensive. But you can't just go into court and say, your honor, it's hard. It costs money because that's not enough information for a court to make a, a decision upon. 
which brings us to support your arguments. And there are some great cases that we had this year that, that highlight this requirement. So when one, it stated uh, it was a battle over motions over search term efficiency, and neither of the parties submitted to the court expert affidavits on the adequacy of the search terms. Now this is, this is in New York, and Judge Francis stated that the expert testimony was necessary for him to offer an opinion as to the most efficient search protocol. We have another t-shirt worthy quote in which Judge Francis stated a court should be hesitant to resolve issues that demand technical expertise. As such, Judge Francis gave the parties three options. They could cooperate with their consultants and try to find the right search protocol. They could refile their motions to compel supported by expert testimony or they could request the appointment of a neutral consultant to develop the search strategy for them both. Another big issue is always explain why something's unduly burdensome or expensive or whatever the case is to the court. In this case, we had a motion to compel. The defense attorney claimed that the defendant had produced copies free of charge of the document sought, thus rendering the plaintiff's motion to compel moot. You know, that's not quite the rule. If the producing party has to pay, so saying something's going to be free of charge for something you have to do really is probably not the best argument. But that's what happened in this case. And the court w was not exactly thrilled with the, you know, defense attorney's curt response and, and called it, you know, a terse response. And they had to get in somebody with knowledge, you know, explain a whole bunch of things, you know, on whether or not, you know, they, they had produced everything that they were supposed to. Preservation. We had several preservation cases come out this year. We always do. Litigation holds is an issue that will, will not be going away. But in this case, it, it's a, you know, long opinion, and then there's a very short section on litigation holds. And in it, the court rejected the notion that a failure to institute a litigation hold constitutes gross negligence per se. So that it's just one factor. You still have kind of a totality of the circumstances analysis in figuring out whether you should issue sanctions or not. Also, and the court highlighted this, a finding of gross negligence merely permits rather than requires a district court to give an adverse inference instruction. This is definite pushback on the 2010 Pension Committee decision that stated, you know, a failure to issue a written litigation hold amounted to gross negligence. There were cases this year where significant e-discovery mistakes were made. One involved Delta Airlines in a baggage handling fee dispute, and in it something horrible happened in which the defense attorney emailed their service provider a list of custodians whose hard drives should have been loaded onto the early case assessment software for a review. The service provider did not respond with confirmation that each listed person's drive was on the system, and the service provider only stated that the files were identified by user employee ID, not by the name. Worse, there was no confirmation that the attorneys ever confirmed with their service provider that each hard drive that was supposed to be run through the ECDA software actually had been. This you know, huge error in project management resulted in a huge tongue lashing from the court. The court stated this oversight is a huge hole in Delta's electronic discovery process and Delta has not adequately explained why it did not ensure in 2009 that every collected hard drive was actually processed and searched through the ECDA software. The court found that the defendant did not conduct a reasonable inquiry and did not substantially justify its failure to ensure the hard drives were searched. It was an unfortunate case because Delta was sanctioned for fees and costs for the mess that they caused. However, they did act very you know, correctly in how they handled the situation, alerting the court and the other side, and offering to bend over backwards to conduct searches and to try to correct the mistake, and they, they should be applauded as such for trying to make things right. Another case, and this one was out of Florida, and it had you know, a very horrible statement that no attorney wants to hear a judge state, where the court stated the law firm acted negligently in failing to comply with its discovery obligations, 
and that the client acted willfully in failing to comply with its discovery obligations and assist its outside counsel to properly litigate this case in accordance with the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure and the Federal Rules of Evidence. Ouch. This was a large law firm and this could have happened to any firm in the country. You had 200 associates and, and attorneys working on the case and the court described it as too many cooks spoiling the soup. The mistake involved this law firm producing discovery directly to the plaintiff without the service provider's assistance. Now, what had been produced was ESI that had been printed and that changed the way colors were and the way it looked. The printed ESI was then scanned back in and produced as a PDF to the plaintiff when it should have been produced as a native file or as a color static image like a TIFF instead. Which brings us to the crossroads that we're now at. One of the things I've noticed is two very different trains of thoughts in e-discovery cases across the country. We have some very proactive judges and we have some attorneys who are trying to fight the future in my opinion. Judge Peck kicked off 2012 with the De Silva Moore opinion and in the you know, now borderline infamous transcript from their February 8th hearing, the judge stated, tell me your method of search and who you spoke to, how you went about it, and what files were searched. Very important questions that every judge should be asking when any discovery dispute comes up. The big quote from the Silver Moore case states, this judicial opinion now recognizes that computer assisted review as an acceptable way to search for relevant ESI in appropriate cases. Now, in this case, Computer Assisted Review was discussing predictive coding. Computer Assisted Review is actually much broader. It deals with advanced analytics. It could be a whole bunch of things that where you use technology to help find responsive ESI. Now, Judge Peck you know, did a great job outlining the goals of Discovery Review. The objective of review in e-discovery is to identify as many relevant documents as possible while reviewing as few non-relevant documents as possible. Recall is the fraction of relevant documents identified during the review. Precision is the fraction of identified documents that are relevant. Thus, recall is a measure of completeness while precision is a measure of accuracy or correctness. The goal is for the review method to result in higher precision and higher recall than another review method at a cost proportionate to the value of the case. Another case that came out in the last quarter of 2012 was out of Delaware. And in it, the Vice Chancellor, uh, the Honorable uh, Travis Laster, at the end of this 65-page transcript states, this seems to me to be an ideal non-expedited case in which the parties would benefit from using predictive coding. I would like you all, if you do not want to use predictive coding, to show why this is not a case where predictive coding is the way to go. The problem is that these types of identification cases can generate a huge amount of documents. That's why I would really encourage you all, instead of burning lots of hours with people reviewing, it seems to me this is the type of non-expedited case where we could all benefit from some new technology use. I heard attorneys vilify this judge in, in conversation for, for this kind of sui sponte, off-the-cuff order on to show cause why using predictive coding wouldn't be helpful. There are lots of cases where judges don't take an interest in e-discovery and doc review and it causes problems. I really think this judge encouraging the parties to find reasons why to use e-discovery or why it could be a mistake uh, is, is in poor taste. You know, I really applaud what, what the judge did here and there could be, you know, reasons why using a single provider wouldn't work. There could be good reasons to use a single provider. But if somebody is concerned about a single provider that's hosting the data and they co-mingling of work product and thus the breach of, of uh, of attorney competences taking place, what I suspect most service providers to do would be to actually have two separate databases and two separate groups of case managers actually working the case. So therefore the plaintiffs logging in would only have access to their database and the defendants logging in would only have access to their database even though it's from the same original data set. That's my gut feeling on how some of the service providers out there would handle this. 
There are, of course, other ways in making sure things are secure to, uh, to make sure no information is inadvertently um, shown to the other side. Regardless, you know, there could be good, good fights to have on whether or not predictive coding works. That's something worth fighting about. However, the attacks that I heard on the judge for this, I, I really do think are unfounded. One area I've been very concerned about is the model order that's been popping up in patent cases. I take issue with the production requirements under the model order. Now, many of these orders state production requests under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure, Rule 34, and 45 involving electronically stored information shall not include metadata absent a showing of good cause. I think this is profoundly dangerous because there's a lot of metadata out there. Now, granted, I do think any discovery request that states produce all metadata is unreasonable because there's a lot of metadata out there, which goes to the bigger issue of first you have to understand what metadata is before you start saying it will not be produced without good cause or that you want all of it because you can end up swimming in more information that you want. Other issues with the model order I'm not happy with that caused me great concern is limiting the number of custodians and the number of search terms right out of the gate. I would wager most of these cases that have taken place have not involved early case assessment on the data that they have. I think it would be dangerous if this happened, because it might not have, if parties are going into court and arguing to limit their ability to search things and to limit the number of custodians before even looking at the data. Have they even conducted a reasonable inquiry before they go in and start limiting the tools that they can use? There are other parts of this that have also seemed troublesome. In one, the court stated voicemail and mobile devices deemed not reasonably accessible and need not be collected and preserved. That seems a little odd. You know, there could be some expert testimony saying the type of devices that were being used and the mobile devices being used were truly not reasonably accessible, but I have a problem with the court just deeming them to be not reasonably accessible. The better line of reasoning probably would be it's not proportional to the case or the voicemail is converted to a WAV file and everyone gets it by email therefore it's being collected when you collect the email. Well if we're going to talk about metadata and whether or not it should be produced without good cause I think we have to understand the different flavors of metadata out there. Substantive metadata reflects changes made by the user, including prior edits and editorial comments. Embedded metadata consists of text, numbers, content, data, or other information that appears in native files with spreadsheets, formulas, hidden columns, hyperlinks, references, and fields, and other database information. Embedded metadata is the type of metadata you actually want. This goes to the guts of what the files state and are, can help you can help prove your case or your defenses and you shouldn't just carte blanche say that you can't have it without good cause. I really think that runs afoul of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, Rule 34 and Rule 1 because you're going to make it harder to go find stuff. Finally, there's system metadata which reflects information created by the user or by the organization's information management system. System metadata is like the underlying guts of the, of the data. This is information you probably don't need in most normal civil litigation, but there, there are times when you do need it. On the flip side, if I'm requesting e-discovery, I would want to know the system file pathway for what I'm requesting so I can authenticate it so I know where it came from. But if we start blowing up metadata and saying that it will not be produced without good cause, I honestly believe you're going to drive up the e-discovery costs when you're trying to drive them down. So in my opinion, here are some of the dangers of following the model order that limits the number of search terms, limits the number of custodians, and states metadata will not be produced without good cause. I think it impacts negatively the duty of candor to the court because you cannot effectively argue and represent what the truth is if you're not looking for it. I think it limits the reasonable inquiry that attorneys can conduct because if you don't have the data, that underlying data that makes all the great technology we have actually work, it's going to limit your ability to do reasonable inquiry. Additionally, search terms are an art. You know, just think of Judge Francis and the court shouldn't just weigh in and decide technical issues without some expert testimony. 
I fear attorneys going out and trying to limit search terms without getting expert help to understand what they need to look for. This is, in my view, like trying to argue your way out of a root canal. You're not going to succeed. You're still going to need the root canal at the end of the day. It's best to use the right technology to find it. Now, I understand very well how e-discovery can be expensive. I understand the desire to make sure that things follow rule one, that costs are proportional to the merits of the case. And I do believe instead of motion practice trying to limit search terms and to exclude metadata, the better approach is to use the technology that we have. Because if you're going to spend thirty to forty thousand dollars on motion practice with attorneys who bill three hundred to five hundred dollars an hour, that's money that can be better spent getting to the merits of the case. So use something like early case data assessment technology to identify the relevant custodians. Use visual analytics to see the communication patterns to go like, you know what, there are 17 custodians that we need to worry about in this case. You're not going to limit that number and make it go away by artificially coming up with only 10. Use the tech to find things out. Additionally, interview the clients. Understand the data that they have how they communicate, what technology they use, do they text a lot, do they use instant messages, how are they communicating, because that will impact what you have to look for. And additionally, don't be afraid to use an expert. A lot of this information, you know, is details and expert knowledge that's generally outside the realm of being an attorney, that you need someone to help you to understand this so the court can make an informed decision as opposed to going into court and saying, Your Honor, it's expensive, and the best way to deal with the expense is to limit search terms and limit the number of custodians. This is as dangerous as saying you can only have three legal research search terms per cause of action in your case. No attorney would ever agree to that, and they shouldn't agree to that when it comes to search terms on electronic discovery. You should meet and confer, you should bring your geek with you and you should understand what you can do to make things more cost effective, not trying to use a judicial hammer to make the point instead. So the crossroads that we are now at, I think focus heavily on education. We have the judges who are not afraid to use technology, who understand social media, who attend conferences, who attend webinars and are going out of their way to educate themselves. There are a lot of attorneys doing the same thing. We need more of that. We cannot hide our heads in the sand when it comes to electronic discovery. We can't argue it away. We're not going to advise our clients to throw out the computers, throw out the cell phones, go back to rotary phones and typewriters because we don't want to deal with data. The rest of the 21st century will have lots of data and involve technology that we have to use to find what's relevant and responsive to our case. So that's the crossroads that we are at. We have to look ahead. We cannot look behind. There are many educational resources out there for attorneys to do this. I've been helping Michael Argfeld at the Law CLE Center with an event they're planning at ASU in March. I think that will be helpful. There are online trainings as well. And there are many people offering good programs to educate people. So I would encourage attorneys and judges to attend the educational programs that are available to them and learn. I think that's what we have to do as we look ahead to 2013 because electronic discovery is not going to go away and we can't make it go away. Behind me is Silicon Valley. As we look ahead to 2013, I encourage all of us to be creative, to be innovative, and to solve our clients' problems in the best ways we can. Thank you all and have a wonderful 2013.